the most rapid collapse of fertility ever witnessed happened in that 30 years and that happens to be my medical career and and in endocrinology i got to have a front row seat on the mechanisms by which this infertility is plaguing humanity and so i'm very fascinated that i was given the opportunity not only to be human and finite right now but to be given all of the scientific and you know kind of cognitive frameworks to be witness to the collapse of everything so the turning points that i look back on were all surrender moments and when i say surrender that is finally the moment where i stopped being my own problem it was in the depth of of meeting humans at their moment of death my third subspecialty was in, in hospice palliative care so when you're admitting 80 patients a week to die wow. and you do that for four years <laughs> you start to multiply that out and you've seen tens of thousands of deaths yeah and not a single one of them ends up looking like an endpoint and so you get to see tens of thousands of rebirths happen Zach Bush, what a pleasure it is to have you here with me today. My brother, my friend, um, what an incredible time we had together recently. It was mm. so fun. One of the big highlights for me to go to Egypt was to know that I was going to get to spend some time with you, and you definitely did not disappoint, which was, <laughs> <laughs> which was fabulous. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here, my friend. Well, I was honored to be on your travels. It's just your generosity there and your wisdoms that guided that trip were second to none epic epic journey with a bunch of 40 super powered human beings and just an honor to be among it all it, it was so fun to be there i felt like we experienced something very different and um you know i've had the privilege i'm sure you have too to go lots of places i mean geez you've been all over the world chasing like white <laughs> lions and everything um can you tell us a little bit about your experience there in egypt there yeah um, maybe I'm beginning to be able to tell you about that. I, I really, honestly, it just it's in probably the top three events of my my travels as far as like the amount of information that traveled in over that t time was so potent that it just takes a lot, I think quite a bit of time, maybe years, maybe lifetimes to unpack something like that from to really understand what it was all about. But I think first and foremost, what I experienced there was one of the most extraordinary permission vessels I've ever been in. Like it was just hands down one of the most extraordinary moments as a human being to be able to walk into a space where absolutely anything was going to go. Uh, I could express whatever was going to happen to me without fear of judgment or without fear of upsetting somebody or freaking somebody out. and when you walk into that a space like that and have that level of license and freedom to express whatever is going to come through the amount of your own intelligence that you experience is just beyond words like because all of us have the data bank that we have there's a vague connection to blocked by the egoic veil and you really as a new friend and colleague gave me permission to go places with myself that i just have rarely been allowed to go or allowed myself to go and so I think first and foremost is deep gratitude for the wisdom you have, the intention that you set behind those trips to allow people to explore the revelatory relationship that we have to an amazing amount of information within ourselves. So it's beautiful. It was a, a beautiful adventure and as spectacular and bizarre and esoteric as the experiences were in the catacombs beneath you know the plateau as much as in the in the high chambers of the pyramids themselves it was the humans there that were really a penultimate experience and i've had the blessing of you know now counting so many new friends in my life and you know among the standouts which were so many alan green oh on. yes like <laughs> what the heck happened to bring that man to the planet right now and i have just dropped in with alan we've had so much fun together since the trip and uh, i just feel like i've i've found a new mentor in life in in alan there so thank you for i, I feel very on. blessed to have had alan in my life for the past five year five and a half years now 
And, uh, you know, it's kind of a funny story about how I met Alan. Uh, do you know the story? Vaguely. So, uh, so I, I was kind of fanboying Alan Green. And I reached out to him. I'd seen a video that he did on some esoteric stuff related to all three measurement systems of the foot, meter, and cubit being embedded in the architectural design of the Great Pyramid. Wait, what? <laughs> How could this be? Wasn't the meter just invented like in 1799 or something? And this sounds totally bizarre, right? So I kept sending him emails and messages, and he's too busy. Like, he had no time for me. He was busy decoding Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so finally, one day, I finally got his telephone number from someone. I called him up out of the blue and I said, hi, Alan. I said, I know you're busy. I'm sorry to bother you. I'm just going to say one word to you, tell you one thing. And then if you think it's interesting, then we can continue the conversation at your, you know, sort of desire and will, or if not, then we could just hang up and you could say goodbye and you go along your merry way. And so he said, okay, what is it? What is it? And I said, okay, so the name Yahweh, what's that mean to you? He goes, yod Hey vav Hey, right? He starts, you know, saying Straight to me the exactly Hebrew. the name, the Hebrew name, right? I -A -S -H -I -A. He goes through the whole thing. And then he says, what about it? And I said, well, have you ever thought that maybe the shape of the characters of yod Hey vav Hey look very similar to pi to the seventh power and pi times seven? And he's like, okay, you got my attention. And I said, what if it's an equation that's pi to the seventh power divided by pi times seven? He goes, what would that turn out to be? And I said, 137. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, okay, you got my attention now. <laughs> and then he invited me to his house the next day. I stayed there till like midnight. You know, all afternoon. Because he had to show you how many times 137. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, 137 is the, the famous fine structure constant, which has been referred to by the va very famous physicist, uh, Richard Feynman, as it seems as though the, the hand of God has pushed his pencil on this number, but we don't know how he pushed his pencil. Uh, it's the most mysterious number in physics. It's the electron coupling constant, the veritable mirror between light and darkness. So the zone of determination between threshold energy that determines whether you have reflection of a photon or absorption of a photon. And it was pretty funny because that's how I ended up finally getting a meeting with Alan Green. And then <laughs> from that po point forward, we were thick as thieves. So we were like partners in, in everything uh, related to decryption and cryptography and cryptology. and. You know, he's such an amazing person, and he gave the most incredible performance ever oh my gosh. in the King's Chamber. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, I don't know if I can talk about that. That's <laughs> one of the things I'm still trying to integrate. My God, what happened there? Yeah, I mean, the King's Chamber is one of the more difficult places in the world to, to be. <laughs> you think? It's, it is, A, difficult to climb up to, so you're climbing you know, up into this. But the thing that really makes the King's Chamber so challenging, I think for most of us is the heat. It is it's so hot and inhumanly hot place, which makes absolutely no sense. I Maybe you have some explanations for this, but the first time I went to the King's Chamber, it was even, it felt maybe 20, 40 degrees hotter than it did this time. But you're sitting in billion pounds of stone. <laughs> yeah. And stone, especially when placed on the surface of the earth, should always be at about 55 degrees. And so what phenomenon occurs in a pyramid to allow a chamber within that much thermal mass to hold such an extreme temperature makes absolutely no sense because you're basically sitting in the middle of an air conditioner. And so, you, I don't know, you can reflect on that if you think you, you got some answers to that, but... I don't. Picture being in one of this. <laughs> That's a good question, it's an though. Energetically impossible phenomenon. So you're in this massive stone that should have a temperature of 55 degrees, and yet you're in what feels like an oven uh, with a, a weird amount of humidity in there too, because it's not actually humid, but it's not dry, and so it's this weird zone in there. Feels musty. Oftentimes mm -hmm. when I've been in there, mm -hmm. it's just you don't want to be in there. It smells bad, and mm -hmm. it's a, we walked in this time, and there was almost a fragrance in the air and there mm -hmm. like it was and the air was moving which again is impossible but there was a very interesting air in that room and we were all told that alan was going to make a presentation mm -hmm. didn't know what and even he, i was like kind of like 
you know, white knuckling it. Yeah. <laughs> to climb up into the king's chamber, the man wears the one thing that would be impossible to wear in the king's chamber, which is a white Victorian esque tuxedo <laughs> with the flourished, you know, botanical front side to it, the whole thing. Like it, it's so, and a white t- top hat. And then he proceeds to somehow have carried up his laptop, a, a, a carrier for a, a platform for the laptop. And an innumerable amount of props that end up going into this next hour presentation. And in that time, he gives us his very first public performance of uh, a script that came to him. Apparently, is just a continuous download of information, but it's a discussion between uh, basically God, Moses, and Shakespeare. And he plays all three parts simultaneously in this what should be a monologue feels like a trilogy of of wit and performance that just integrated with integrated with music, music and, and props and like it's just like and, and the history of the world meanwhile i can't even <laughs> the like breathe the i can't even like i'm like slumped on the wall of the king's chamber and here's this guy like i'm just trying to figure out where he's getting so much energy from to do this performance for an hour he's drenched to the bone probably sweat out three gallons of liquids i mean the man was superhuman in that delivery and it really began the week in such an interesting way i mean this was in some ways our our beginning yeah. day and mm-hmm. we'd already been through a bunch of pyramids that day and it was we were i guess 18 hours into many pyramids and and it was now two o'clock in the morning and he finishes this performance but i i think that what i got from that experience without having had time to integrate the whole journey yet but Alan was showing us what it looks like to be ultimately the divine comedy how to become the fool um, that classic card in the in the deck the fool is such a overlooked aspect of divinity I think which is humor and the freedom to express absolutely anything that comes through. Yeah. And so I think what he showed us in that performance, among many other wisdoms, is if you cannot find the jest in the sacred, you probably are missing the point of the sacred somehow, you know. And it's tempting, I think, especially there was a lot of people in the room that had never been to Egypt before, and here you are in the Great Pyramid of Giza for the first time, and you're in the king's chamber, and you're... You have all this heady, maybe, expectation of what you're supposed to achieve or experience or whatever. And he just diffused all of that in that performance, reminding us uh, with sunglasses that lit up in fluorescent patterns and all <laughs> kinds of ridiculous things that the closer you come to the sacred, the more loosely you need to hold the, the I guess the gravity of your own belief system. You have to not even believe yourself in that moment. You have to have such a loose hand as you approach the true vibrations of truth. He showed us that we must have such hilarity over the frailty of the human experience that's about to be had because the human just cannot, it's not a vessel capable of truly expressing the infinite. Yeah. And so you have to keep this sense of humor, this levity, this sense of vulnerability in the expression of being human, this finite thing that we call human that's about to experience the infinite. Wow. And uh, that's, I think, ultimately maybe what every day in nature should be showing us is, dude, the second you take yourself seriously, the second you put any gravity on any emotion you might be feeling or any thought you just had or any new you know discovery you feel like you just had you just have to be in hilarity over it because that thing predated you by so far and yeah. is this you know you, we are there's a great scripture that i love it says that that uh, basically to be human is to see through the, the glass darkly mm. and the glass darkly was is in the literal translation of what was thought to probably be the Aramaic for stained glass. So you can imagine the human condition is looking at reality through stained glass. Yeah. So all we can really see is little shadows and mm-hmm. maybe a little bit of vague form, but we can't see how beautiful it is on the other side because the glass has been stained. 
And so I think that in a, in a very beautiful, poetic, and absolutely humorous way, Alan's work there, there that night really just took me to my knees of any human, you know, egoic part of, of that journey that whatever you are about to experience, you will not have words for, and the words that will come to you will be so frail or so far from the full gravity of the truth that you need to remember to laugh yeah, and dance yeah. and just be in celebration of what you don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, I think, my favorite... <laughs> My favorite way of looking at the world is that I feel like the more I learn, the less I feel like I actually know. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's kind of maybe that is putting ourselves, as you say, so eloquently into the fool yeah. position, right? Which is maybe that's part of the divine comedy in of itself. Maybe that is the purpose of it. And, and then after that, Alan's performance, which was the you know, piece de resistance uh, of perfection. Uh, there was a moment for me too, because I've seen Alan crash and burn, mm -hmm. like crash and burn on, on things that were supposed to be funny jokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was the time he played the heretical Pope in my board meeting, uh, which did not go like anything better than a lead balloon would go next to you. Um, but I've never sweat so much in that moment that I didn't that moment <laughs> in my life. And, um, but I, I was watching Alan do this and it was hot in there and I was like, okay, Alan, this is really, really, you know, you're, you've gone to great lengths to present something. And I couldn't resist the feeling that I had of some anxiety in a way, as you can imagine, it was so hot, it was dying in there. And he's like f trying to get his thing straight as this, that, 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 that. And he and I have a standing like discussion all the time about, you know, I always argue that perfection is the enemy of good enough you know so it's just like go and um but he and i worked together so well and i just looked at him and i said you know what i'm just going to love every single moment of this and no matter what happens it was as it was supposed to be it, it was perfect for its perfections and imperfections absolutely oh it was so beautiful and about 10 minutes into it and you know, I started feeling okay. This is this is good. This is really good. And then about twenty minutes into it, then he gets to the part where he plays the song, the da 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 da. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I like look around and everyone's crying. Yeah. And it was like we laughed, we cried. You know, we. I don't know how much money it was that we kissed goodbye, <laughs> but it was it was an amazing treatise it was this monologue or dialogue or trilogy i'm not even sure what it was of god conversing with himself in the king's chamber while wearing a white top hat and of with all of his white hair and majestic beauty as he is it was just an amazing experience and that was the perfect precursor to what we experienced after which i've never heard mm anything in my entire life mm. like what we experienced in that that night and i remember standing there next to the sarcophagus and something just hit me so powerfully and i was just like oh my gosh we're we're in heaven did you feel that yeah i, I it, when that vibration or thought hit me it was uh a couple hours later when we were in yet another pyramid that night and uh, the cafe we we're in cafe yeah. and in that in the feminine energy of that yeah it was beautiful place mm -hmm. uh one of the women that was with our journey mm -hmm. went through a cataclysmic you know experience energetically and had a huge emotional release and then she started singing Oof, that and was incredible her voice that the voice that came through her that night is the the closest I've heard in human body to, like you say, this is what another realm sounds like. This is, you use the word heaven, but really what you're speaking to, I guess when I say that word now, it's, it's to say that this is what it would feel and the sensory experience be if there was no alteration in the frequency of truth. You know? yeah. And there's something about our planet in its position or its design or the 
the nature of life as it's occurred on this planet that we sit behind that veil such that we do see through the glass darkly we don't quite see the frequencies of truth mm. purely it feels in our human experience yet and yet there's these moments that pierce that so poignantly and my gosh did her voice pierce that that yeah. night so uh, and that was the first of six of the most epic days of my life so i, I mean it was yeah, I really have no words for how much beauty we got to witness that that week. We we watched so many humans pop through their ego yeah. shields into their their most true perception and then expression of self. And, yeah. and there's just really nothing more beautiful than that than we'll experience as humans. So grateful, very grateful. Well, thank you. And um, you're a doctor. <laughs> Once was, yes. <laughs> Um, what led you to be here now? A lot of answers to that question. Um, I've experienced things in the last 10 years that I could would not have believed possible and would just discount as fiction had myself 12 years ago heard these things. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, you know to answer that question is to confound my own capacity of understanding or logic in some ways but what I believe has been happening to the infinite nature of myself the infinite part of me that we might call a soul or we might call an energy field that thing i believe has been vibrating through different aspects of the universe since the beginning of our time and i believe that i've been bumping into this planet many times and i feel memory in different places around this planet that is inexplicable and i know i'm not the only person to experience that so yeah. i think we are all bumping into deep memories and i don't know if that's memories that I have personally gained I think it could be as much human memory that I bump into and there's something about the antennae within me that pick up on those channels of information or and so I, I don't know that it's my infinite being that was here in a finite body and experienced something and now I'm remembering that or it's just an, an amount of information that exists in nature that I bump into and recognize but suffice it to say the physician in me has been seeking deeply the opportunity to heal something within the relationship between the finite and the infinite since my origin like there's something that i feel that is really innate to my being that has been sometimes patiently and oftentimes desperately seeking the the root wound and uh it tortured me through my academia. Uh, that's a lot of people are, have introduced me as a triple board certified physician. And then people are like, Ooh, that sounds really smart. No, that's not a smart statement. It means that the guy was so unsatisfied by what he learned in his first one that he went and did a second subspecialty in medicine. And he was still so unsatisfied for by what he knew. He still chased another one. So it's in my lack of satisfaction for the knowingness that came through those deep studies in different parts of medicine that led me to the third and ultimately led me to out of academia. I, I found that the, the truth that I was looking for could not be found there. And I just kept drilling and found, you know, much of that truth in my patients ultimately and as my greatest teachers rather than some academic, you know, marbled hallway. And it was in the depth of, of, meeting humans at their moment of death my third subspecialty was in, in hospice palliative care so when you're admitting 80 patients a week to die wow. and you do that for four years <laughs> you start to multiply that out and you've seen tens of thousands of deaths yeah and not a single one of them ends up looking like an endpoint and so you get to see tens of thousands of rebirths happen and the veil becomes so thin at birth. My, my introduction to medicine in this lifetime was, was through an uh, effort with an uh, international group of midwives in the Philippines and was birthing babies there. I was going to engineering originally. 
had that experience, couldn't go into engineering anymore, went into medicine. If you've ever been blessed to sit within a room to witness a life coming through the womb, through the vaginal canal of a woman, you have witnessed the most miraculous thing that any living being will see. It, it is a true portal into an infinite zone when that finite body presents itself and takes a first, first breath. And then to consider that that being, that human being that just took its first breath, self-organized yeah. in the womb of its mother in cell division of one cell that turned into 70 trillion human cells, not a single one of which could have lasted even a few seconds, even a few milliseconds <clears throat> without the life within it, which is microbial, it's called mitochondria, mm -hmm. that are liberating sunlight inside of a human cell. And so we are sunlit beings that self-organize tri 70 trillion copies of the same cell yeah. to become dozens of different organ systems that communicate across grandiose distances at the at the microcosm mm -hmm. level of a human body to coordinate a biology that can hold a neurologic experience through which almost all of nature speaks we now know that intelligence is the result of biodiverse data streams the colon of a human being has just recently been discovered to be the most complex ecosystem, most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet. It is more biodiverse than any other colon in any other animal, including mammals, and it is logarithmically more complex than non-mammal multicellular mm -hmm. creatures. Mm -hmm. And the recent neuroimaging out of UCSF and some out of UCSD and a couple other universities over in, in Asia are showing us that the living human colon and even our small intestine is is not the beginning of the human body. We we thought that the the gut barrier like our skin was the outermost, you know, touch with nature. And so we figured everything outside of the gut or every, everything in the tube of your gut must be outside and everything inside of that that human body or on the other side of that that gut membrane must be you. And in this neuroimaging that's now done in live tissue, you're able to see that the, the brain sends out billions of afferent nerves that pierce the veil of your gut lining, pierce your veil of self-identity mm -hmm. to, to speak and listen directly to the bacteria themselves. And that is the data stream that becomes intelligence. And so when billions and billions of nerves listen into a biodiverse ecosystem, and that ecosystem is given access to speak information into a single neurologic system, you get intelligence. This is the CPU chip of a complex computer. But the CPU, chi CPU chip and any of these fancy computers you have in this building have never thought of a damn thing. They have no intelligence innate to them. A CPU chip is simply something that at high speeds can move information through. It can allocate information here, there, 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 but it needs information to decide where it's going to allocate information. So the CPU chip is absolutely not the brains of the operation, and yet we call it the brain. So this is just a central processing unit. This is the switchboard operator of nature. And the thing that gives us the perception of intelligence is that we have hundreds of thousands of species that can speak through my CPU chip simultaneously. And it's for that spectrum of information that I get to speak for nature. Nature speaks through me. God speaks through nature. And so is the divine, anything that we would call God, actually slowly designing biology to be able to speak its own voice, to speak for itself, whatever that is. So why did I get here? How does being a doctor get me here? My doctoring effort towards looking for the root cause of injury, i.e. That, that injury that has tinted our glass to the reality we live in such that mm -hmm. we cannot see it clearly, comes down to the fact that we do not trust the voice that we speak. Hmm. We don't believe we speak for nature. We actually believe nature is against us. We think we got rejected by nature. 
And you just need Alan Green to perform his thing to remind you that it began with a rejection from the garden. And we got kicked out. And if you speed forward a couple of hundred thousand years of human history, we go from kicked out a garden to an English Oxford dictionary that defines nature as everything in the firmament of the earth, including minerals, plants, animals, except humans or anything humans has created. We wrote ourselves out of nature and everything that we would create out of nature. And that ultimately, I believe, in a long journey of being a physician, maybe hundreds of times, I can tell you that the root injury that leads to all dis-ease is the belief that we are not of nature and that nature is not speaking through us and we do not trust that voice therefore and for that we have deep insecurity that requires an egoic shield and we hurt each other at nauseum we destroy each other we war at infinitum and we are always at war for this root injury and so my desire as a physician ultimately has got me down to the point where if I can just show humans the nature within them then there's absolutely nothing required of me as a physician because they heal themselves as soon as you trust your own voice and that angelic voice we heard that night in the, the last pyramid of the first day that there, there was the angel that found herself and she sang a note so pure that she healed 40 generations back 40 generations forward she started a new genetic line for her humanity and i've gotten to witness that a few times in life and that's why hospice was such an important last healing process for myself probably but certainly my last frontier in my my asking medicine to show me something true uh, it showed me that if if you trust the medicine within the soul that sits in front of you it will show you something so magnificent and so beautiful mm -hmm. that you can't even put words to it and i got to see elders do that i got to see you know one woman comes to mind dying at 96 years old she showed me something so beautiful that words can't explain it uh, i remember it from an extraordinary 12 year old girl who died of a horrific metastatic cancer in my my clinic she had been through like 42 rounds of chemotherapy 12 massive surgeries it had her leg completely removed through a few different surgeries her pelvic thing removed. i mean just one of the most horrific human journeys and she was one of the most pure unvictimized beautiful beings that i've ever met and she showed me something in her moment of death that is is also just so excruciatingly perfect that it cannot be there's nothing that can change that that is a truth that is indelible in the history of, of of the universe and so it's these moments that i've come to trust that to be a physician anymore is to just absolutely surrender any part of that human journey and to be a, wit a physician is to only be a witness now and to be a scientist is only to be a witness now. You, you can have no intent as a scientist and actually see the beauty. If you have any intent as a scientist, you fuck up the data immediately. Yep. And so if, if we are not leading and living from our curiosity as a pure signal of the divine within us, then we're going to create murk. We're going to create the mud. We're going to create the stained glass. And we will only see truth vaguely through it. Signal of the divine within us then we're going to create murk, we're going to create the mud, we're going to create the stained glass, and we will only see truth vaguely through it. It will still be astounding in its beauty despite the stained glass. But I yearn for the beauty of those moments, man, and I, I just, I, I wonder what it would look like to live a life where I wake up and I breathe, and with my first breath of the morning on a pillow in the sunlight, I'm already in that space. Yeah. There's no human emotion that can be projected at me or pitched at me or triggered inside of me that could take me away from that that period of life. I would probably stop being human at that point. I, you'd probably move right into the infinite, I suppose. But I love the dance at that edge of the veil, at the, you know, how how much can we purify the glass that we look through such that we can see the other side more clearly such that we can have more gratitude for the fact that we get the gift of finite existence right now. Uh, finite is a very, very, very valuable experience. 
infinite is uh, lovely. That's such a profound thought. It's, it's only for the finite that we can see the beauty. It, the two are simply complementary yet opposite conditions of each other. Absorption and reflection. I love the way you just put that, that you love the dance at the edge of the veil. That's very, very beautiful. You are a deeply spiritual human being. I've seen that um, the times that I've had the pleasure and honor to be around you. Uh, one time was at Arcadia and where you gave this rising, rousing speech, which was uh, very, very memorable for me. It had a huge impact on my life. And for that, I, I thank you. No, I remember it all. So you had a better experience than I did. <laughs> 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 we'll leave that there. <laughs> and um, it was uh, afterwards when we were sitting, you know, with Aubrey and others that I really got to feel your your heart and how you express yourself and how genuine and authentic you truly are. And you are someone who literally wears like <laughs> it's it's not an armor. <clears throat> it's completely penetrable. You wear your heart all over you not just on your sleeve. And I think that's one of the, the greatest examples of what it means to be a human being that I've ever seen embodied in someone. So that's a, a very, very deep compliment mm -hmm. for me to give to you. And it's such an honor to be here with you. But I'm sure that along your journey, you must have had major turning points. And I'm also sure that you probably, especially coming from three board certified spe subspecialties, along your journey, you must have gotten some pushback uh, from those specialties and the friends and colleagues that you probably had in those specialties when you went through your life change. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened then? Yeah, I mean, those stories are so many and it was, was a long and winding path, so it's too much to recount in a podcast, I suppose. But, um, you know, uh, try to, trying to distill down a couple of those uh, first of all, you know, just for everybody listening, you know, you guys are all living such revolutionary lives. Nobody stepped into this moment of being a finite being to to have an easy go of it. I mean, every, everybody picked the pressure cooker moment of human history to we show chose up it. right now. We chose this. And and the manifestation of being in this space is is potent and it's blessed. I mean, that that we are the eight billion that got chosen for this moment. I believe there's probably many more, more infinite beings or infinite realities that tried to be here right now. You know, because it is the most interesting thing happening. It's, in the, it's the best ticket in the universe, right? It's so <laughs> fascinating what's happening on this planet right, right now because <laughs> it will change everything. For light or dark, it will change everything. And so we are blessed to be here. The Achilles heel of my journey was not the... Not the naysayers of colleagues and, you know, family members and everything else that will come into your life to say you're crazy or you're on the wrong path or you're mm -hmm. making bad decisions the the thing that most limited the smoothness of my journey created the most extreme turbulence in my journey was my own doubt of self and the universe is relentlessly wearing that down and so if you feel your journey is really tiring and exhausting and there's so much friction and everybody's trying to stop you that is freaking you <laughs> like we are creating that it's a yeah. condition for ourselves mm -hmm. And so the turning points that I look back on were all surrender moments. And when I say surrender, that is finally the moment where I stopped being my own problem and stopped being my own biggest naysayer or, you know, opponent in, in life. When you are finally so broken and so exhausted, so out of energy to maintain the stories that you're telling yourself, then you finally have the breakthrough. And I had to come to that many, many, many times, including the last five days. I'm constantly hitting another threshold of possibility of surrender. And, you know, there's... it. it 
many times over the last decade as these have accelerated so much so that I'm just, I can feel the next one coming. I have a PTSD over these moments now where I, 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 pre, I, I perceive <laughs> the <laughs> exhaustion that I'm about to go through. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh my God, I don't think I can actually survive it. I think this one will undo me completely and I will just dissipate. There's, a, there's something I get to see under the microscope all the time in my biotech lab called apoptosis. And it was my area of specialty in mitochondrial metabolism when I was back in chemotherapy development days of my career. But apoptosis is such an interesting thing. It's, it's when a, a mitochondria, a bacteria, living inside of a human cell realizes that human cell is no longer contributing to the greater whole. And the mitochondria flips a switch through this little protein that I was expert in coop tf1 and that was my little protein expertise and <laughs> coop tf1 flips and holy cow the whole mitochondrial cascade suddenly triggers this apoptosis cell suicide event and the human cell which is thousands of times larger than a mitochondria the whole human cell responding to that little signal from that little bacteria living inside that human cell says ah it's time for me to disappear and the cell literally under a microscope over the next minutes and hours and usually takes about 48 72 hours for a cell to completely move through this journey uh, at least that was the dogma i was trained in. now i've found out and seen under a microscope that it can actually happen logarithmically faster than that but nonetheless it's it's at a slow enough rate that it's very easy to observe under a light microscope the whole cell turns into like this effervescent you know it looks like you know co2 bubbles in your in your gas water or something like that like your sparkling water effect where the the cell which moments ago looked completely solid suddenly turns into all these tiny tiny bubbles and then just dissipates quietly it doesn't require an immune system it doesn't require an immune cell it doesn't inquire in, in, require inflammation it just simply dissolves into into the ethers no no trace of it left within just you know, minutes to hours i think we do that apoptosis thing when we are at our best when i'm at my best i'm willing to surrender at the level that i'm willing to let everything that i have worked my entire life and maybe lifetimes for dissolve immediately and completely dissipate into nothing and that's a terrifying thing. The first time that happened was, you know, probably the first time I remember it happening was was when I was 18, and that event led to me deciding to go to the Philippines and birth babies, and the whole life changed. But it was a, a moment of deep heartbreak, and my heartbreak, you know, I blamed on a girlfriend, but it really was my heartbreak that I had so disrespected myself that I was willing to do that relationship. Mm-hmm. It was my first relationship that I ever had. And it went against all of my natural instincts for what I deserved and what I wanted and what I was, you know, Mm -hmm. holding myself for. And so my heartbreak wasn't over the girlfriend. My heartbreak was over my own lack of self-love that I would have done that to myself. And it took me years to figure out that that's why I was so deeply wounded by this experience because it didn't make sense because it was just a short little relationship and you're a kid and what the heck. But in hindsight, my gosh, was I heartbroken for myself that I would so not care better for myself that I would allow that that to be a first relationship. And as I've journeyed through life, I find that again and again, boy, the world builds us up to this point where we're so afraid to let go of the thing that we've built and and says well i've poured all this time and effort and all this in and one of those of course was when i decided to finally leave academia in 2010 i was terrified because i knew for a good six months that this was going to be the decision you know deep Mm -hmm. down but my brain was not letting me go there you know Mm -hmm. and everything was resisting this and man you know i'd spent 17 years in academia i'd had this a whole house mortgage worth of school debt and my kids were growing up quick and we're heading towards college and they were going to have school debt on top of mine and and I was making $75,000 a year as an academic professor and it's like you just got nothing like you can't you're insoluble financially you're out of energy because you've been working 100 120 hours a week for you know years and you're just flat out freaking exhausted and then the world, you know, or your deeper, higher self says, all of that, it was not the thing. You got to let it go now. Just let it go. 
bubble tea you know just let mm-hmm. that thing dissolve into effervescence and the terror the i mean the gnashing of teeth and just like the anger at, at the divine and god and cosmos and myself the whole thing and so it's just you know i i think i'm trying to paint <laughs> brush strokes here of a life of resistance against the possibility that i could be more beautiful than i can possibly imagine oh that's all i'm resisting wow so you're resisting confronting the possibility that life could be more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. Why is that scary? It's frightening because the world has set our value system and the metrics for value on that which we can build. And if the real world that I live in, the real reality behind the, the, the stained glass is more beautiful than I can possibly imagine, then it means I didn't fucking build a thing. And that's the wound that I carry, is that then I must not be valuable. Mm. If it is more beautiful than I can imagine, then why am I here? What what am I contributing? So that sounds almost like the mitochondria deciding that it no longer contributes to the overall whole and going to Alka-Seltzer land. And it's interesting, the mitochondria is not eliminating itself as much as eliminating it, the, the human. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it, it's this very strange providence of energy that the mitochondria provides the human, the, you know, and in every single human cell, there's 200 mitochondria on average. In a human, single human neuron, there's 2,000 mitochondria. We are teeming with life within ourselves. Mm-hmm. And if we come out of alignment with life, the life within us will eliminate us. That's so interesting. And so I, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time also studying this concept of apoptosis and, and cell death and why it happens. But the way you described it is like you're calling it cellular suicide, which is really an interesting. I never thought of it that way. I mean, we use ways, other ways in, in the healthcare um, targeted technologies to induce cell apoptosis. But to think of it as a voluntary decision in a way because it's no longer contributing because it doesn't understand its meaning. It reminds me of why people don't like math. (laughs) The reason why so many people don't like math, I believe is because they've been taught math and they've been led to believe there's no meaning behind the math. Math without meaning just becomes information. Mm -hmm. But I believe that math with meaning is divine communication and we are connected always to the divine. So that must have been, I guess, that point where, at least in my own circumstances, it's that edge of the veil that you just described. Dancing at the edge of the veil is sometimes I've been able to see through the thinness of the veil and see the divine and experience it, or it reaches through the veil to touch me. And I don't think of God as this one old guy that looks like Alan Green, although he could definitely play the part. <laughs> he would be well cast. He'd be very well cast. He, he was definitely well cast that night. But I think of the entire universe as God. The the beauty of all of it in its rhythmic balanced interchange is so perfect. It's mm. so beyond. Mm. And all mm. we have to do, and I feel like, you know, as Aubrey says, you know, he's like, can you imagine if you're sitting with your with with God and and you're talking to God, the universe, and God would just sit here and say, Tell me more. I'm so excited to learn what you have to say. Because I, I do believe that the one divides itself into the many for the joy of observing itself through our unique eyes of perception. That moment that you have realizing, recognizing the dance at the veil and then being touched by the divine and then that leading and catalyzing a whole new chapter in your life, which now you've inspired millions of people around the world to see themselves differently so that they could listen and trust their own inner voice and thereby achieve their own healing. What an incredible story. I can't think of a more beautiful story. (laughs) Yeah, I, it's, I mean, I just feel very privileged. I feel very blessed to be walking the walk I'm walking because I get to see so much beauty reflected in and around me. And 
Uh, yeah, it's overwhelming. Uh, it, I wish I was an enlightened being on so many levels, but then I would lose my finite quality of being able to see the beauty and then it would all be lost. So I think a lot of dance, again, is that divine comedy, the divine fool, the the sacred fool. Uh, I am that sacred fool walking through life, being witness to the most extraordinary beauties that we are allowed to see and perceive. And I immediately and simultaneously I'm capable of the most trivial self-abuse that any being could possibly conjure and so I have to I have to be able to hold both those things as real I am a frail un you know unaware being walking in a vessel capable of knowing everything <laughs> and so it's like <laughs> What a paradox. It is the most painful par paradox. And um, Lynn Twist is a beautiful colleague. She's on my board for one of my nonprofits. And she said something so amazing yesterday in our board meeting. She, she, she was quoting somebody, I'm sure, but I, I for whatever will quote Lynn in this now. But she said that pain pushes us forward until vision pulls us forward. Hmm. And I think that I am stuck as all humans are right now in the pain because we cannot quite see yet and so we don't have clear vision we do look through the glass darkly and for that we have great pain we have great pain and the pain pushes us forward and compels us forward and so one of your early questions to me was what brings you to i think you were yeah. you're a doctor what brings you here now what brings me here now to this moment is my pain i have so much discomfort inside of myself over what I can feel is true but don't know, have connection to yet. I, I can feel it right there and yet I continue to behave myself and I see others behave around me in a way that is completely discordant with that truth that is imperturbable and more beautiful than we can imagine. And that causes great pain in us. And this is, I think, why we self-abuse. I think it's why we abuse one another. It's why we abuse our own children we abuse the children of other peoples because they look different on us or have different religious beliefs we'll go kill those children and think we're sacred for that like we are the darkest freaking thing on the planet and yet the whole cosmos knows we have the most extraordinary technology within us which is the capacity to vibrate in this frequency that we call love mm -hmm. and for that they sit here with bated breath asking the question will this species leap past the darkness of what they are capable of to do what they are here to do and boy we have brought it to the most interesting of moments because we are right now uh, talk <laughs> we, about we dancing are, at the veil <laughs> we are definitely we have it. brought ourselves to this point of extinction and in my my second so especially was in endocrinology and metabolism so and my career starts in 90, 1992, so you can imagine 1992 to 2022, you've got a 30-year journey through the most rapid collapse in the history of 300,000 years of Homo sapiens, the most rapid collapse of fertility ever witnessed happened in that 30 years, and that happens to be my medical career. And, and in endocrinology, I got to have a front row seat on the mechanisms by which this infertility is plaguing humanity. And so I'm very fascinated that I was given the opportunity not only to be human and finite right now, but to be given all of the scientific and, you know, kind of cognitive frameworks to be witness to the collapse of everything. Man, it's... When you see the miracle of birth and then watch that same species decide voluntarily to poison themselves until they can no longer do that miracle... The deepest, darkest pain that you can imagine. So we have not talked about this yet, but I would be fascinated to learn what you would describe the contributing factors of that to be the collapse in fertility. Mm. Starting from the early 90s. Yeah. So, what started to express itself in the early 90s uh, was basically what I would call a cumulative genetic injury. And, and so, uh, kind of the pisser of disease is that you don't know what you've created until your great-grandchildren are born 
and the what that phrase is, is speaking to is this phenomenon of transition of information. I better said the transition of trauma stored within the genome and where that happens. A good example of this is DDT. So we started spraying neighborhoods all over North America with DDT to kill mosquitoes in mm -hmm. the 1950s. You know, mosquitoes carry disease and malaria. We had all these scary things about mosquitoes, and so we need to kill the, the mosquitoes. So literally, in the evenings, kids were riding their bikes around. And I remember. Everybody's out, and the trucks would drive up the street <laughs> spraying yeah. DDT in the air with like, as if it was like a celebration, you know. So drenching the neighborhoods in DDT. No apparent injury, all good. Nobody's getting sick. Must be fine. All this, and then suddenly, ten years later, those women that were sprayed with DDT in their backyard start having babies, and suddenly those babies have an extraordinary amount of disease starting to express itself at very early ages, including birth mal malformations at birth and uh, in utero changes, neurologic dysfunction, immune dysfunction, even cancers. Those children, that generation of children born to women sprayed with DDT grow up and they start having kids and oh my god what did we let loose and so with each generation we saw a compounding level of disease from DDT exposure that didn't happen in the first generation because the first generation takes that on as an epigenetic trauma yeah. mm -hmm. epigenetics are basically the the immediate reaction of a genome mm -hmm. to trauma or injury and so there's an immediate reaction. It says, ooh, ow, that hurts. Well, we better fix a bunch of things. We got to get trigger your immune system, trigger out some inflammation, get this thing fixed up. And you do a bunch of damage control. But that doesn't get erased. And so it gets carried and passed on in utero. It gets passed to, the, you know, really in the ovary, in the exposure of that whole uterine environment, it gets exposed to that trauma. And so that next generation is carrying the epigenetics of DDT from the moment of conception and so you're going to see it deeper in its expression in that second generation. Third generation, now epigenetics of the mother, mother sicker, has less ability to pass nutrients on, kind of cascading. Still epigenetic though in that third generation. And then by some bizarre, you know, justice of nature in the fourth generation, those epigenetic patterns of trauma get passed into the germline. The germline is, is a description of the, the now not epigenetic kind of reactions of the genome, but a permanent storage of that genomic record of trauma down in the nucleus, down in the DNA of mom and dad, in the ovary, in the sperm. That fourth generation is now going to express that at its deepest level, and it will continue to express it from there on out. 1992 hits, and we are now at that point starting to birth the third generation of DDT babies. Unfortunately, DDT was only the beginning of our new relationship to the chemical industrial complex following World War II. And so by the 1950s, we're putting atrazine and other chemicals into our food system as herbicides and pesticides. Uh, those are starting to cause problems in the 1970s. And so Monsanto, when they come out with this new chemical called, called glyphosate that would be patented and then trademarked as Roundup, that chemical debuting in 1976 starts its second generation expression in the 1990s and so we have DDT accumulating atrazine accumulating agent orange in the environment and if you look even a little bit further back uh, in uh, 1917 we were told that the worst you know flu the Spanish flu killed 20 million people which mm -hmm. was more than not killed in all of the other conflicts sure. of World mm -hmm. War One. And when you heard the recent pandemic, everybody's talking about, well, this is the worst we've seen since you know, 1917. 1917, everyone, yeah, this is, you can take this for truth or whatever you want, or you can just take this as, you know, new information. But I would posit that 1917 was not a bad flu year. It was the first year that flu naturally occurred on an entire global population that had just been poisoned the year before by mustard gas. <laughs> And so we poisoned the planet with mustard gas in 1915 and 16 at a level that has never happened since then and had never happened before then. Mm -hmm. Mustard gas was the thing that ultimately you know broke the broke the stalemate of the Western Front and all that in Europe between the the Ottoman Empire and which would be Germany and and 
you know, the rest of Europe there and, and mustard gas had been outlawed by, and a treaty had been signed in 1888 or 1898, swearing that nobody would ever make that stuff because it was, had already been witnessed to be too toxic for humans to even touch. So everybody signs that says, yeah, no, we would never do that in 1898. But by 1916, we're like dumping this stuff into the atmosphere. It's like, there's no tomorrow. So we poisoned the entire planet with mustard gas in 1915, 17, or 16. And then, of course, normal flu season rolls around and everybody has injured lungs uh, from mustard gas that Jeez. had been distributed around the planet. Mustard gas is one of the slowest moving gases that you can introduce to an ecosystem. When you read accounts of World War One, you can the, the soldiers would say they could see the green cloud of gas an hour before it hit their trench. And so they had to sit there watching this encroaching death, you know, knowing that every mucous membrane in their body was about to be denuded and just, you know, raped of any protection. And so they would watch that slow green cloud moving towards them, and then they would be in horrific pain. Mucous membranes weeping all over their bodies. Well, that gas slowly distributed around the entire Earth's atmosphere in 1916, uh, preparing us for the 1917 flu season and we blamed that on Spanish flu and it was just a normal flu strain that hit lungs that had been poisoned with mustard gas around the whole world. All of that is to say that what happened in 1990 as we saw this infertility start to rage was a accumulation of poisoning of the atmosphere and the human condition within it that began at the beginning of the century and culminated in what would become our chemical food system by the 1980s. And so we have thoroughly poisoned the human genome to such a traumatic state where we can no longer reproduce. And uh, we are now at one in three males in the entire developed world is infertile by sperm counts. That number is expected to hit you know, one in two by maybe 2035. Um, when we hit, you know, 50% of males in the world without the ability to to reproduce when trying, the success of the other 50% is usually 50% of that. And so, you, when only one quarter of your population is actually being reproductive at any given moment, you see a very rapid negative population event occur. And so. When people are like, oh, we got too many people on earth and blah, blah, blah. And you hear, well, we got to do this or that. You're like, are you kidding me? We are going to be so lucky if there is 100,000 people left on this planet by 2080. Because the level of infertility combined with the level of, of disease that is about to be released from our pent-up genomic poisoning of the 20th century is going to be an awesome destruction of beauty. And so... What I feel that we are in for over the next, you know, it almost sounds is, like human apoptosis. That's it. In a I way, mean, it's is like nature a, saying that you are no longer playing the game. <laughs> you know, and and it's not a decision. It's not even judgmental. It's not even. It's just nature saying that's incoherent with my expression. Hmm. Nature drives for one thing, which is absolutely a dedication to biodiversification. Nature has been working for 4 billion years on this planet to diversify, 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 and then a species comes along and says, we're going to create monoculture everything. We are going to reduce biodiversity in every way possible until we are the only thing. And we do that in an ICU. We sterilize your body with so many antibiotics until we're sure that only the human can live in that room, and then you die miserable. And so it's, it's in our fear of everything that we have put ourselves at war with everything that we sterilize the human condition into the greatest state of suffering that biology has ever experienced and then we call that human <laughs> it's like well that's what we've done and there is no amount of intelligent technology or philosophy or anything that can heal that that is what is going to happen to the human condition the human condition is going extinct. And so, we only have one option to stay in play, which is no longer be the humans that we have been. We need a massive transmutation, transformation event in the human condition that has to begin at our resolving the root wound that we think we are separate from nature. And if we will do that together, 
and we will agree that we are of nature and nature speaks through us and at this moment we are the most dense cpu resource for the nature to speak through meaning we have more opportunity to hear more information and data than any other being on this planet has to let this nature that expresses the beauty that this planet has we are the thing that it's been designing we are the technology that it can speak through when we do that we have a conformational change in everything within the physics of being human and when the physics fundamentally changes the biology gets to follow and so we need a change in our physical expression meaning the energy field meaning what that which the mitochondria produces which is our energy we need a a re harmonization of the energy within the human condition such that our biology can follow to make a seismic change in its information stream in its expression at the genetic level our dna our proteins that come from the dna are going to have to go through a transformation that makes the cumulative trauma of the 20th century irrelevant and that's what we've been studying in my lab for the last 10 years is is the grace of nature big enough to absorb the cumulative trauma of the human condition of our last century and the answer irre unequivocally irrevocably is yes the grace of nature is so much bigger than the most well nature is incredibly resilient once you get the equation right and i think that makes all the sense in the world to me i mean <laughs> you'll see it with just planting a seed and and watching it grow when, when the garden is tended properly and and it's given the space to grow i think that's and i i feel like we're on the precipice you know again dancing at the veil of a different veil and that veil is a new earth and that i think so many people like yourself and and many many others are starting to feel and recognize the tangibility of that possibility but what do you believe it's going to take Surrender. Yeah. The thing I'm most afraid of is that I will see through the veil and just see how beautiful it is and might, you know, realize it's more beautiful than I can possibly imagine. Am I willing to surrender my own sense of metrics of value such that I have to be the one to produce the future? I need to make the discovery for the future. I need to make the I need to be the doctor that heals the person that then <laughs> yeah. becomes a thing. Yeah. I need to do this. I need to, you know, I've been trying and trying to surrender, 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 surrender down to the point where I am just a freaking kid, wakes up in curiosity every morning, that is willing to love unconditionally the experience I'm about to have. That, that's basically what I must do every day, and each of us on this planet must do now. Wake up as a child, meaning no belief of limitations. Hmm. To be a child is to have no concept of a limitation. So wake up in a limitless state of childlike curiosity and passion for exploration. And be willing to have my heart so wide open that I love every moment of it without any idea of what it's going to bring me. And I get to watch kids do that every day. And I, I've been living a life where once my kids grew up, I've been trying to align myself with you know families or other experiences where i get to see a five-year-old turn into a seven-year-old that moment of three to five to seven is these these moments in which the ego starts to express itself yeah and i feel like every time i watch a child go through that deprogramming of power deprogramming of self that happens as that veil comes up is such a, a heartbreaking thing to witness in a child but it's so informative as to what my day should look like which is to back out of that personal experience how do i lift the veil on myself such that i become the the five-year-old again and then once five how do i lift it so that i can become three one of my colleagues during covid like everybody else had to start a, a home office and so it was like a broom closet down the end of his hallway he converted to his quote-unquote office and had his little zoom camera set up in a broom closet and so he's like stumbling down the hallway from the kitchen in the morning and he's like kind of blurry-eyed carrying his coffee and 
his his set, uh, how old is it? What's that kid at that point? Six year old comes bolting out of his bedroom, runs, you know, doesn't see dad, goes, you know, down the hallway and goes bolting into his little brother's room that's three. And his dad's like, alarm bells going off like that. That looked way too intentional. That kid's getting. So he goes to look into the room to see how the old kid is screwing with the little kid or beating him up or something and just freezes in witnessing the seven year old just shot or six year old goes shooting into the three year old's room and then sat down at the feet of the third three year old and says, Johnny, can you please explain to me how it feels because I'm starting to forget? That six year old woke up with a sudden terror that it was disconnected from source. And it ran to its three year old sibling to be please reinforce my what it feel tell me, remind me, because I'm starting to lose it. And that dad just lost it at that moment, understanding how many years it had been since he must have felt that. Whatever his six year old was yearning for, he had forgotten was even possible to feel. <clears throat> I get to see that journey all the time at that other end of the journey. And you get to see it in an 85-year-old who becomes a 90-year-old, becomes a 95-year-old, that becomes a 105-year-old. My great-grandmother lived to about 102, and pretty much all I remember from her last 10 years of life was all of her sex jokes. Like, <laughs> she was so inappropriate and she just thought it was hilarious because it was so unexpected because she was the quintessential cute old grandma right she's like five three and just like hair always like perfectly curly and gray and happy and she had a big smile and little spectacles like she was like the sweet librarian grandmother that she was and just saucy as all get out and <laughs> and and so she had found her three-year-old again, and she lived very long and happy and robust until her last days for the rediscovery of her three-year-old. She knew what it felt like to wake up every morning being directly in connection with the source and, and not having to worry about her ego definition of self or what role she was playing in the world. And, and she was just pure genius. Those, those years of her life, she... She did things that were seemed preternaturally intelligent. She she predicted stock markets. She did all kinds of things that didn't make sense for literally a ninety eight year old or hundred year old librarian Frederick Maryland. Like she was exhibiting a freedom and a intelligence within her because of her opportunity to decode what had been programmed in her at age five to seven. And so this is the journey we're ultimately on is can we become childlike fast enough that while we are still capable of being productive in some way, we can elicit the most beautiful things. And Khalil Gibran, one of the greatest bra brains in the 20th century, was asked, you know, how should we parent? And he said, it's super easy to be a good parent. Every day you just strive to think more like your child. And every day you make absolutely sure you don't make your child think like you. And that's what it means to be a mm -hmm. good parent. And so that's that's what I need to now deprogram. And that's you know, seventeen year, years of academia was preceded by, you know, twenty years of human belief systems and all that. And so I had forty years of decoding <laughs> to do, and it's just you and Alan Green going at your things. Like <laughs> I had to decode and decode and decode until I could find the upside down parallels and the hidden words and the and the ultimately that that in, incredible devere inside of me that that of truth to veer within me and i am of truth and that is an incredible discovery to make about life and each of you are to veer. each of you are of truth and that is unperturbable it cannot be changed by human beliefs behaviors mistakes poisons toxins genetics epigenetics can't be changed to veer is within you you are of truth. You are the entire story. The story has been encoded into you at the genetic level, at the bone level, at the brain level. You, you are the manifestation of intelligence such that it can connect through consciousness to a knowledge field that is infinite in the universe so that you can see beauty because you are an infinite being that just chose to be a finite expression right now. 
and so we here we are living this ridiculous mystery of being human and it's messy <laughs> and it's just pathetic and it's also the most exquisite thing that will ever happen in the universe so grateful to be here with you you know uh, it's interesting the story you just told about returning to the childlike perspective it reminds me of when i lived in south korea i lived in korea and i lived in japan i lived in hong kong and you'd see kids running around without any supervision yeah. and so you're like what is going on you know we don't do that as much here and so I, I'd ask thoughtfully and just with a high degree of curiosity, like, why, why are kids at you know three years old, four years old, able to run around and do anything, the stuff that would be crazy rude even? And someone explained to me one day that they are the closest to the divine. And you don't get that opportunity again until you get really old. So they saw it as an arc. Mm -hmm. across their lifetime so you could say that starting out from you know coming to this world you get to you know two three four years old five years old as you said and you've got an inordinate amount of freedom in their society and then you end up at seven and the harness you know and the shackles begin and there it is super strict <laughs> right. You've got to go. Not only do you go to school from, you know, eight to four o'clock or three in the afternoon, but you also go to something called Hagwan, which is like the supplemental school that goes until like nine or ten o'clock at night. And it is like a, it's just differing degrees of literally torture. And it's brutal and high suicide rates, you name it. And then you end up graduating and then hopefully you go to one of the top universities. You know, it could be Seoul National University if you're in Korea or or Tokyo Daigaku, right, if you're in Japan. And then from there, you get stuck into a salaryman job. And the shackles just get tighter and tighter, yeah. right? Then you've got this life that almost seems like it's devoid of potentially having meaning. You're locked into this, and now you're in your 40s. And you have duty and obligation ascribed to all of that. And then finally, when you get into your 60s and 70s, that's when you can actually start getting fully respected by society again. Because now you're returning to that arc that get, brings us closer to the divine. And I always found that so fascinating that someone in society that's 75 or 80 years old has a tremendous amount of respect and can run around and do whatever they want. Just like the children that are under five years old can run around and do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So in a way then, we're almost conditioned to believe that during this arc of our lifetimes, in this middle section, right, we go through all this suffering like it's just part of the way it's supposed to be. So then when you actually are confronted with this notion that maybe behind this veil is the most beautiful life you could ever possibly imagine, and could you actually accept it? Because what we have to actually grok is that we chose it all. Even all the pesticides and herbicides and all of this in some way, we're in a U inverse that is a reflection of what's happening inside of us. I'll tell you a theory as to why we needed it all and why we chose it. Why did it. we need it? Why yes. we chose it. <clears throat> the current expression of human genome is a two-stranded DNA. Ancient prophecy, modern prophecies, the whole thing are telling us that it one time was 12-stranded DNA, mm -hmm. or at least it has the potential to be a 12-stranded DNA in this in some new expression of itself. So I've been fascinated by that. I've been working on it for years in, in our basic science lab and in clinic of how do you actually get DNA to change its confirmation. And the bizarre reality is it's not, the secret is not in the DNA at all. It's actually in the water. Yeah, I was just going to say the that. DNA floats. <laughs> and so... Uh, human cells, 70 trillion of them, 70% water by volume, are not liquid. I cut myself the other day reaching for an orange high up in this tree, and uh, as I picked it, it came across a sharp you know, briar and, and cut the back of my hand open, and a little bit of drug, blood trickled out. But in that moment, I, I disrupted billions of those cells, or at least a million cells. And so you tear open a whole mess of cells, and yet no water comes leaking out of me. And so how does 70% water vessel not leak any water when the cell yeah. membranes have all mm -hmm. been disrupted? Mm -hmm. And the answer is because all the water is in a gel state. 
and mm-hmm. so it's like jello so you tip over the jello bowl and it's still in its form it hasn't lost its form it you removed the form but it holds its form it's so like the surface happened. tension so it's 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 a it's gel it's sur- like it's the... actually a crystal mm-hmm. so jello is actually a crystalline reorganization of the water around the protein in there so the gelatin <clears throat> is a protein it's a long strand of of filaments that the water then organizes around to become a crystal structure such that it's no longer liquid Mm -hmm. dna is a filament within a crystalline water the crystalline nature of the water is a combination of the proteins that are within that things like actin myosin things like this that are inside the cell uh, but also the electrolytes and so the minerals and nutrients combined with the protein and sequences when they create the jello and then the DNA, that little nucleotide sequence, is held in its in its beautiful, eloquent, you know, spiral by its relationship to H two O. So the nucleotides within the sequence of the DNA interacting with the electrical charge of water in its current format in my body says, okay, human, human water, human DNA is going to be a double stranded DNA. It's going to be a double helix. The excitement that I, I've been having in clinic dating back 10 years is was that we were uh, able to start u- using a camera out of Russia that allows you to image the human energy field. And that started giving me a much deeper look in all my patients walking in the door. Instead of like, well, your electrolytes are a little wacky or this, I could immediately see their entire energy field uh, via their their fingertips. You ten, 10 images across each fingertip. It's a plasma discharge. and too complicated to talk about all the things but the the result is that you can see exactly where that human being carries stress and how that stress alters the water structure within their cells Hmm. so long story short is we started to recognize the relationships between emotions stored emotions water structure and then dysfunctional protein dysfunctional body disease and so suffice to say after decade of imaging thousands and thousands of people, emotions are actually sitting at the foundation of our disruption between self and our current body's expression of self. And so all of that is to say that why did we choose a century in which we would poison everything, and most of all the water? And so glyphosate, king among toxins, now 4 billion pounds of, of glyphosate being poured into our environment every year. 4 billion per year, 4 billion pounds of a single toxin that happens to be water soluble on a planet that's 70% water, that grows plants that are 70% water, that are consumed by animals and humans that are 70% water. We chose a path in which we would poison the water so severely that 85% of the rainfall in the United States, 85% of the air we breathe is contaminated with glyphosate why did we have to poison every freaking level of the water what were we doing hmm. well it's <laughs> in 300,000 years we've been sitting here walking around with two stranded dna and pretty happy about things not realizing that we need some sort of massive transformational confirmational fundamental change with nature Catalyst. to express mm-hmm. something more beautiful mm-hmm. because we can't imagine how beautiful the nature is trying to be Right. And so we look around and we become, we normalize a two-stranded DNA experience. Mm-hmm. And we look at all the human cells mm-hmm. and Watson and Crick come along and we crystallography all the DNA. And we say, ah, it's all double-stranded DNA. That must be human. In the last few years, four-stranded DNA has, uh, has finally been imaged. Expressing. Mm-hmm. The only place that we have found four-stranded DNA is in cancer cells. Huh. So it's a mutation that we're now recognizing. Maybe. Or it's a new opportunity that can only arise in the setting of a cell that has completely lost its identity as the previous human. A Interesting. C- cancer cell is inherently the only cell inside of a human body that is completely c- disconnected from self-identity. Every other cell is remem- remembering your trauma and your mom's trauma and your mother's mother's trauma and uh, blah, 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 40 generations of trauma. And that cancer cell got so isolated that it forgot the trauma 
And in this moment of time where the water has been poisoned, its memory is disconnected, it can't do anything, its only drive now in that state is survive. And the only way a cancer cell that is too damaged to repair itself can survive is to replicate. And so that becomes a cell that starts to repeat its own injured self over and over again. That becomes a tumor. Cell damages itself once more. It doesn't have enough nutrients within itself. It starts to send out emissaries to get more resources. And so now this cell is trying to figure out how to create a whole new universe around a new self-identity. And a few of those cells are capable of holding a complex enough crystalline structure in the water to allow a four-stranded DNA to occur. So the lesson we are teaching ourselves in our journey into poisoning ourselves to the point of everybody having cancer is that our journey into a 12-stranded DNA is going to look a lot like the cancer journey. It's going to look like a complete loss of self-identity right before we make the conformational change of the crystal. Well, that water sounds familiar. <laughs> so have you looked at this gel water? Because I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Gerald Pollock. Yeah. Um, and his research on easy water. But I actually believe there are multiple states of water that we are not aware of yet. Oh, yeah. yeah and yeah. They, they each with each change of the dihedral angle, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you know, you've got 104.7 uh, degrees. Uh, you've got 111 degrees for the difference between vapor and ice, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting that right in the mean value of those is 108 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, what is also interesting, and you may not, because some of the esoteric knowledge is, I think, tied to this also, that we know that DNA is a stacking array that takes on the exact shape of the dodecahedron, right? Which is the 60, you know, it's a basically pentagonal sides of 12 pentagonal sides in a regular format of the dodecahedron. But the icosahedron, which is the exact structure of of not only water clusters, but also the truncated icosahedron in particular, which was the same exact structural shape of, of COVID-19, um, is such that it is the dual solid of the dodecahedron. The icosahedron and the dodecahedron are always together, whether we see it or not and recognize it or not. And so when we look at the double strand of DNA, and you just think about the dodecahedral structure stacking on top of each other, the number of, like, think of it uh, like if you're a wakeboarder or if you like skiing or something, water skiing, you kind of leave a wake behind you. The exact protrusions of each of the dodecahedral structures as they go around creates a double-stranded DNA. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as we place the key points of the protrusions of the icosahedron. So now you have the icosi dodecahedron and you stack the icosi dodecahedron. Now you've got 12 wakes that come around that. And at the center of it is a structure form that creates the diamond shape pentagonal form, which is the same as Durer, Albrecht Durer. So this center structure is creating now a new dihedral angle internal to it that's 108 degrees. I believe that each of the dihedral angle transitions represent these different states of water. I'm actually presenting at this water conference on Sunday. Um, and, and there's been such incredible research on this. It actually relates also to what we experienced in the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid that you've probably heard now that they've been able to document even that thought, we already know that thought and water are very inextricably linked, right? So you can think a thought and then they flash freeze the water and the water ends up taking some of the same characteristics and form as your thought. Even photographs that you might look at or placing a photograph next to a water can, and then freeze that water, it takes on some reflection in the frozen form of that water, which is truly bizarre. And the same is true also with liquid crystal. So liquid crystal, which takes on more of that gel Format. So now it's making me want to study all the dihedral angles of liquid crystal displays, yep. etc. So then why would this not also be true for rose granite, which has 55% quartz crystal composition? Do our thoughts then have the ability to make that form malleable? Can it 
cut granite? Can it be, can memory be left in the form of the granite, just like it possibly can be? And it seems to be showing through research that it does in water as well as in liquid crystal. And that's a, a really deep question I have, but I feel like we're somehow on the verge of this, especially with this global throat shock, or you just said it and it was so beautiful. You said, oh, that you want people to be able to trust in and believe in their own voice that I believe that something in our voice signature is so powerful that it actually can heal the body. And it has this ability through our own affirmations as well to heal others. And it is interesting that on the wall, on the north wall of the King's Chamber, um, the Zodiac is basically showing up. And this is the first time I've really talked about this in any of the podcasts. But right before we went to go to Egypt, we had discovered that um, the walls and the designs on the walls are actually the decan of astrology. So 36 decan, and uh, and these are the three sub-segments for each 10 days of the Egyptian year, which is 360 days, which is really just a balance between the sun cycle of 365.4 days when you include the leap year and 354.6 days for the lunar year. So that gives us a mean value of exactly 360. Mm. So we had to have the extra five days at the end of the year for the moon cycle to catch up to the sun. Mm-hmm. But because we ignored the feminine, it doesn't even show up in our calendar system. Mm-hmm. So now when you start thinking in those sense, okay, the Dacon was this beautiful system of 10 days, 10 days, 10 days, and each one represented a different, more unique aspect, attribution of the larger zodiac. So within Taurus, there's... Uh, Ostriga, Eridanus, and then Orion constellation. And so when we, right before we left, we, we, before we left to go to Egypt, we had discovered that the designs on the walls were remarkably matching the Dacan, which was mind blowing for all of us. But what I discovered on the wall right before leaving was not only did we find the face of Orion to represent the Orion constellation on the wall, but also the bull and the cow that we'd already discovered is right over the throat. So the throat is managed by Taurus. We've sort of known that as well. That's why it's the blue. And you've probably seen in maybe astrological charts, et cetera, that Taurus has a big impact on, on the throat. But what was more fascinating than all of it was that over the throat and over the mouth were strands of DNA that were basically etched into the king's chamber wall the emanate start on the left side of the wall, so on the west side of the wall, from two dragons that basically crisscross. And then there's two more dragons that crisscross above it. And one of them, one of the dragons goes directly over the throat and the other dragon goes directly over the mouth. I don't think that's coincidence. (laughs) That there's something with the throat chakra fully opening and being activated that impacts the activation of this four strand DNA and then these higher orders of DNA, which might actually be there in the etheric all along because the icosi dodecahedron, the dodecahedron is supposed to represent the etheric structure and the icosahedron represents this water. So you've got the etheric, which also can be somewhat akin to fire. So you've got fire water, which is essentially the balance of masculine and feminine in the alchemical sense. As I think about what you're saying right now, to me, and I I could not agree with you anymore, in fact, I believe this, what you just described, as well as what we've just experienced with COVID and what we've experienced even in some ways with some of the ways that they tried to attempt to uh, approach vaccination for COVID, et cetera, all of this will have the imp of the perverse response to actually be the trigger for our higher order DNA. Exactly. Exactly. Coronation. Coronation. Exactly. Now, now this is kind of freaky, right? Because right after the coronavirus came out, they did, a, they did a study on it and they found that there was snake venom and they published it in Scientific American in January of 2020. And they said it was from two snakes that they found. So this was an airborne virus that had the DNA of a cobra, a king cobra, and an Asian asp. So wait a minute, we have two snakes that create an airborne virus that obviously is engineered, right? In the Wuhan lab, 
And it's called the crown virus for the crown chakra. I don't know. That seems kind of funny. It sounds like Kundalini and crown chakra activation in some yeah. ways. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's just so much beautiful imagery and poetry that could be written into the thing. Charles Eisenstein obviously writ so beautifully on it through 2020 and beyond. But, uh, you know, the, the obvious thing. So a lot of what we're talking about right now, again, I could not have handled or thought about or, or given any credence to 15, 20 years ago. But I think what all of us listening into this you know, conversation could think about is, have I ever changed because I was comfortable? <laughs> no. Not once. You have absolutely never changed direction for comfort. <laughs> so true. Uh, you have only changed direction for the discomfort of running into a brick wall of something or other. And so um, there's this you know, beauty in life that the things that are most painful, most disruptive, most damaging are always the greatest teacher, the greatest opportunity, the greatest door opener, the blah, 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 blah. So just to hold on to that, I guess, in one way, you know, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by coronavirus and for lots of reasons that predated, you know, the, the 2020 moment and have enriched, I think, since then. Um, I held a, a very unpopular <laughs> belief at the time and probably to this day a very unpopular idea that nobody in the Wuhan lab actually achieved anything that was going to be significant. But what happened was kind of a culmination of of nature's ideology or ideation of genomic information overlapping a, a, a perhaps malintent of humans but but an intent of humans to start to shift the genome and um, the first strains that showed up on the on the west coast of the United States were very diverse I mean we had you know, six very different you know uh, corona strains that showed up simultaneously as you know the pandemic started to unfold None of which looked, you know, similar to I think what was probably maybe originally designed in a in a gain of function laboratory anywhere. But uh, once nature gets a hold of anything humanity has created, it returns nature to it immediately. And so the natural system, and what I mean by that is the human didn't actually create something that nature didn't already know how to to return to its original design. You know. And so that's why coronavirus has gotten less and less dangerous and all that with every iteration is because nature's ultimately returning anything that we would do, glyphosate, you know, gene therapies, whatever we are doing to, to fix nature or improve nature always goes awry. We screw up everything every time we would try to do it. But nature has this grace built into her that it's going to make that injury less and less severe with every iteration that nature does with it. And so nature is doing that to humans as well. Like we are getting less dangerous to ourselves with every iteration as well. To become less dangerous to ourselves, it turns out that we have to be so diseased we can hardly get off of our bed. Otherwise, we just create war and hell for animals and humans alike. But we, so we are taking ourselves to our proverbial knees on purpose. <laughs> because when we walk around not in pain, not in suffering, we are hell on earth like we we are the darkest thing you can dream up and yet we are the poets we are the artists and it is for that poetry and art that we have evidence that we can do something that causes no harm it is only in our art that we have created something that does no harm the reason why you are a phenomenal mathematician is because you do not do math you do art you are an artist that expresses itself through math. Walking through your whiteboards here, you've got music written all over in mathematical equations, which is just another way of looking at music. But ultimately, you're an artist, you're a musician, you're, you are bringing forth patterns of vibration through your work, through your observations, through your skills, through your, all your colleagues and their skills and their decoding and that everything's going on around here. I'm struck that we have designed the perfect century to finally end the humanity that was destroying itself and the earth that it lived on. And we would design such a century that would so poison us that we would no longer be able to perpetrate 
and victimize and perpetrate and victimize our human journey and with there only one last thing that we can possibly do in this moment of apoptosis of the old and the birth of the new is to create and that's mm-hmm. the beautiful promise as you let go of the victim perpetrator coin that we keep flipping as that coin does no longer has the metabolism the energy to keep flipping and just comes to stillness this new possibility arises within us that we could be creator and we are going to not just go create new cities or some new earth we're going to rebirth ourselves yeah and we are going to do that on our hospice bed and the good news about hospice is 10 percent of patients diagnosed prognosed given three weeks to three months left to live have to be discharged a year later because medicare is tired of paying for somebody who's not actually dying because they found new life and rebirth themselves and they get discharged and go on to live another chapter <laughs> we are on our hospice bed and we get to be with that 10 percent of peoples that get to be discharged from hospice if we choose to create but to do that, we're going to have to let go of the memory of our trauma, the fear, guilt, and shame that led to, to the trauma, and the fear, guilt, and shame that came out of the trauma. We're going to have to let go of those emotions, let go of the genetics that are tied to fear, guilt, and shame, and go into that complete surrender where we are willing to observe something so beautiful that we can't even imagine it right now, which is to say, are we all ready to be three years old again? And if we are, we have this one in 10 chance, perhaps one in 10 billion, who knows, we have this percent likelihood of creating a new conformational shift in the sacred geometry of our water, such that that dodecahedron right there inside of that DNA strand becomes alive and our DNA simply rewraps in a single moment And we have a different biology at that moment that has no need for expressing trauma because it's been erased. It has been forgotten fully to reveal itself in its full beauty. And then we have a new life. We have a new earth. We have a new thing. Or we just go extinct. And we we go that and we experience it on the other side of the veil. And so it's this super interesting moment we're in. It, it is interesting you say that about the Icosi dodeca because that actually is the crown chakra geometry. It's also the heart. You know, the, the work of Victor Schauberger in the 20th century just blows the minds. Go and look at his model. Ooh, I'm a the, big fan. Mm-hmm. The, his model of the human heart is basically a pump that codes the Icosi dodecahedron into the water of the plasma of the thing. And he was the first biologist to ever observe that the not only the human heart, but no heart in any mammal is large enough to actually pump blood through the resistance of a capillary tree. It's impossible. That muscle is nowhere near large enough to pump against that much resistance. So he was the first one to show that actually blood is pumping through all of the capillaries of the body before the embryologic heart forms in the mm-hmm. embryo of a chicken or a human or whatnot. And so the reality is our blood vessels pump blood through them. The heart then is not a pump. What the heck is it? It's a vortex to mm-hmm. keep changing the conformational structure of the water inside the blood that then would inform the crystalline structure of the gel as it becomes a living life form within your cells. The only thing that's dividing us from a 12-stranded DNA is our failure to trust the heart. Yeah, and bringing it into our own conscious awareness, that even that it's possible. You know, it's interesting. I, I used to work closely with... Uh, the chief of cardiology at uh, at UCI. Uh, his name is Jagat Narula, and um, he moved to New York to San- Sinai. And he was this amazing guy because he showed me that they had just imaged the heart. He and the electrophysiology department had just imaged the heart and found that it was actually causing vortices, and that it was not what we thought at all uh, of the of the fluid dynamics of the way the heart was pumping. And so watching that on you know this imaging advanced imaging equipment was just a fascinating thing and so it starts to make you think okay maybe everything we thought we knew is just only part of the truth and maybe the larger truth is just that every fact we had is simply merely a facet of a larger prism of truth one other facet and it makes me really think about what this next new earth period experience assuming we can make it 
out of the the demise that we've constructed for ourselves, which actually was also just as Isaac Newton says and Einstein says that every action must have an equal opposite reaction. So it, it reminds me of the 12 labors of Hercules. So in the 12 labors of Hercules, you have Hera who tried to thwart Hercules because she wasn't the mother of Hercules. Right. Zeus had had an affair with another woman. And so she was always going to thwart the success of Hercules, her, you know, the bastard child of, of her husband. And yet every time she tried to thwart his success down to the point where the whole thing starts off. She, she turns herself, right? She turns the family, his family, children and wife into monsters. And Hercules comes home and sees the monsters. She says, where's my family? Thinks that they've all been killed somehow. And so he slays every one of the monsters that he then is horrified later to find were actually his children and his wife. And so he now is feeling shame and guilt for having murdered his family. And what happens? Well, in order to redeem himself, he has to enter in the hero's journey. And that then leads to the 10, to the 10 labors of Hercules, which then, because two of the laborers were ruled as not valid because he didn't follow the rules of them, he had to do 12. So we have base 10 system and base 12 system. And What's interesting about it all is that every time Hera tried to thwart him, it actually catapulted him to his next greater success. His future and history were already set. Every way that she tried to enact some grandmother or grandfather paradox turned out to only lead to his destiny, which was to be immortalized in the stars. And I believe the same is probably true for us now. All the times that people try with all of their scheming and negativity will always end up being some sort of catalyst for our next evolution because that train, the past determines the future as much as the future determines the past. They are inextricably linked in my view. And I believe that we have an incredible destiny ahead of us. But it's going to require us, I believe, like you say, to return to the three-year-old mind. I believe it's also going to require us to be able to let go of, and I think one of the things that you said that was so profound was let go of me having to be the doctor that solves it or so-and-so having to be the mathematician that solves it or having to be ascribed to any one thing to determine our own self-worth and our own value so that we can avoid our own apoptosis. And this is one of the things I love the most about our Egypt trip because this was a unique thing. I've led lots of groups to Egypt. I've, I've taken many groups now to Egypt. This was the most unique. It was incredible because of individuals that were there like you, they were all superheroes. It was like you know, the Ascengers <laughs> as we called the group. And what was so incredible about it all was that there was no leader Mm -hmm. All of us were leaders. Mm -hmm. There didn't need to be one who basically stepped forward. And I felt incredibly respected and honored. And, and, but I didn't feel the need to be the leader, which, which was the, wow. What a freedom. What a freedom that was. And to know that everyone would just so beautifully and elegantly play their notes in a symphony and for what you did as well there um everyone it was just incredible and, and i hope that that's a model for what is to come because that i think is going to be what takes us to that next paradigm and why we earn the crown mm. It's a hell of a journey, you know, and you know the even the word "earn" is is interesting. It's one I struggle with. Um, we have a deep we have a deep hope, I think, within us that we will earn or deserve something. We already do. That's the funny thing. And the fact is, we already it's just realizing it, it right? ourselves. It's like we already received it. And so, the, <laughs> is there was it ever really earned? No. Or was it deserved, or was it simply gifted from the beginning? And so. You mentioned the white lines at the beginning. Maybe that's a worthwhile end point for our discussion here is that one thing that the extraordinary woman who, Linda Tucker, who 
who is largely responsible with a couple of other extraordinary beings um, who came along to rewild and recover the white, wild white lions of Africa. And this, the only region that they occur is in Timbavadi, which is a traditional Khoisan word that means the place that the star lions appeared. Which is kind of goosebumpy because the the white lion is actually not an albino. It's actually a, a, an extra gene that occurs to allow them to become white. Hmm. And the fact that the Khoisan people, who's, which is the oldest language and oldest oral tradition we have in humanity, it's a hundred thousand years back versus you know Aboriginal. Uh, environments around 40,000 years, North American First Peoples, 40,000 years. Um, so 100,000 years, the Khoisan people, they, they of course are right on that Grand Meridian, the 31st uh, longitude where all life has sprung forward, the first signs of bacteria, the first signs of human life, all out of the same birth canal. And so this birth canal of the planet churning life forward and the Khoisan people have a word, the place, that the star lines appeared well if you had a word for appeared it means that you remember before it was there and so it's intriguing to me that it is likely that the Khoisan people remember when the white lion gene showed up mm -hmm. and so they've mm -hmm. been witness to the emergence of a new genome within the lion um, and of course in the western you know religious traditions we have this whole lion of judah thing and yeah. the lion mm -hmm. plays very very big into mm -hmm. our understanding of this arrival of consciousness, especially atonement, the, the concept of, of washing clean the, that stained glass, right? And so the atonement, the forgiveness, the, the clarifications of our falsehoods expressed now in a biologic line of lions in Africa. This new gene shows up, they witness the appearance of this thing, and then they prophesied that this line of white lions would go extinct and mm -hmm. then reappear and in reappearing, they would carry the new codes for peace for the new earth, and they would download those into the neural network at the moment that the earth was ready for its transformation. They went extinct in the 1990s. And then on Christmas Day, the 25th of December 2000, two yellow lions gave birth to a white lion. That white lioness, born in captivity, was thought by scientists and everybody else to be incapable of being wilded because any lion born in captivity has been generationally divorced from the instinct of how to go hunt, kill, blah, blah, blah. And so this was going to be in captivity forever. Linda and colleagues came along, made a six-year argument to the government that they should be allowed to be given the rights to take this lioness back out into nature and, and attempt rewilding. By the time they succeeded in that, she'd had four cubs, white cubs. And so, or maybe it's three. So the four of these, these cu three cubs and, and the mom go back in 2006 out into nature. On the very first day, mom tucks her cubs into a little hole in the, in the bush, goes out, kills an antelope, brings it back, offers it to her things. Today, there's three prides of white lions that have come from that single lineage, 26 lions. Around 2018, the first lion starts to download the information into the earth and does this by biting off the end of her own tail and this was drawn in cave paintings in, in aboriginal culture just as in african culture that there would be a lion that would not have the tuft of the end of the tail but would actually have in, in depicted often a human hand on the end of that thing pressing down into the earth and so this this lion bites off the end of its tail pressing this in she over the next six months a 12 year old female they live to 15 to 20 years old, 15 being pretty typical. That's an old lion. At 12, fully female, beautiful specimen of a female lion, suddenly becomes fully phenotypically male, with exception of the genitalia. She grows this massive mane and becomes this other being. We are at a moment when transformation is happening in nature. The impossible is becoming possible for lions as much as humans. We are being given a new gene that would allow us to atone, to clarify, to be able to vision that what we've actually been given. And the pain no longer has to push us forward. The vision can pull us forward. 
And so we are reaching a moment of transparency where gender and the old expressions of pain no longer have to define us and we can embrace both the masculine and feminine within each of us mm. can complete itself. And the codes of the new earth will no longer be the battle of justification of a wounded masculine that suppresses the feminine within ourselves, let alone those around us. And we can literally allow nature to express itself in a being that was designed to vibrate in the frequency of love, inspired by our unique capacity and our finite beingness to see beauty. And so these are brushstrokes that we are seeing in ancient prophecy to modern time experiences that life is beginning to do the impossible right in front of us. Cancer cells are starting to express a more complex sacred geometry in their water structure than the healthy human cells next to them because the healthy human cells next to them are anything but healthy. They are programmed with a, a, a devalued, a destructed water structure because of some belief that we believed at some point. Mm -hmm. Some five-year-old, seven-year-old moment happened in the past to our species where we forgot what it feels like to be connected to source and trust that and believe that source would speak through us. And so we are so close to the end, to the beginning, to the rebirth, to the, from the omega back to the alpha. First time we sat together, you, you had that beautiful moment of oh my, one over omega is alpha. And one divided by alpha is also omega. And so we are in this paradox of the infinite being expressed in the finite, the finite being finally comfortable in itself to be perceived as separate such that it can see the beauty, knowing deeply that it is not separate, but it really expresses the whole. We switch from victim perpetrator, victim perpetrator to creator, and the divine can finally speak through us. We start to trust our voice which is then coded with the frequencies of our heart. And in that moment of coherence between heart and voice, we speak for nature. The water confirmation has to change, just as you've spoken to. The science is proving this. As soon as the frequency of human feeling comes near a water glass, it will change its confirmation. We are stuck in emotion. We must lose emotions as a programming, as a program, as a belief system, as an experiential filter lose the emotion and become feeling allowing yourself to go on the entire ride of every carrier wave that comes through your body allow yourself to feel everything and you will recode the water in every one of your 70 trillion cells the sacred geometry will up level itself to a higher order the gel structure of the water will then carry the dna to a new strand and the memory of the epigenetics of the last century will be erased in that moment. And there is a powerful prophecy that came through recently in the last couple decades, powerful prophecy that says in the decade between 2017 and 2027, which now we find ourselves dead yes. center of, <laughs> in that decade, humanity will lose the genes of fear, guilt, and shame. You know, I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> Wow, I have felt and said this many times over the last few years. And I remember the first time I came across you and your work was during COVID, probably 2020. So that's kind of when everyone was looking for answers and looking for things, especially in April. Uh, you know, it was sort of the month after. We were like, is this going to end? And everybody was, gonna was in fear. <laughs> and everybody was in fear. And that's when I started teaching sacred geometry on like a master class on, on social media. And I came across your stuff and I was like, wow, this is it. really interesting. And I remember at that time, my big aha was that the world's not a difficult place because people so much hate each other. I came to the realization the world is a difficult place because people hate themselves. No. And if we could just recognize that it is our sovereign lineage it is our evolution it is a natural consequence of who we are that we choose this experience and that when we're ready to step into our destiny and step into that sovereignty it happens as a natural extension 
of all that ever was and all that will ever be. It is simply our path. The greatest aspect of the hero's journey is the transformation that the hero goes through internally. And every one of us is the hero. The realization that each and every one of us are here to find the hero within us. That we are the hero we've been looking for all along. It doesn't have to be found outside of us. But to recognize that means that we must let go of all shame, must let go of all guilt, must let go of all blame. And let go of the victim. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I just think the world of you. I think the world of your work. Thank you for all the things that you do to help so many people around the world. And most importantly, just thank you for being you and being so authentic in who you are. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks for the conversation. Always stimulating to be around you. It's been a thrill to, to see you in your in the lair of this lion that walks the earth. And so it's beautiful to see what you've created in this world, Robert. And uh, you know, for all of you listening, I just honor whatever moment you're in there. Uh, I, I can I can match you for your your horror, your frustration, your hopelessness, and and the deep knowingness in you of of the future that we all know is possible is right here. And so, um, all of that is is what we should be feeling right now. You should be in a a very very high state of dissonance, not just cognitive dissonance, but human feeling dissonance right now because all of the things are happening at once and as we become comfortable that we actually are feeling all of the things the horror the joy the love the fear the guilt the shame once we acknowledge we are fear feeling all of it i think the glass goes clear and and that's what it looks like to be on hospice and finally give up this pursuit of longevity and all the drugs to palliate the longevity and all the things uh, the, that was the funnest thing about being a hospice doctor is you stop all the drugs of every patient that's admitted. Yeah. And when you watch some miracle that we call a human body be released of the finite limitations of a drug toolbox, you mm. get to see the miracle rebirth. And that rebirth is so profound for one out of ten of those, they're going to not die. Yeah. And so we have drugged ourselves to a the limit of biologic survival and uh, in that drug induced coma that we now dwell in is this murky reformation recreation recollection of the human design and so all of you are in this primordial stew of opportunity and so I hope that something you've heard today starts to allow you to let go of old stories, old narratives, old everything, and start to become available to this new expression of yourself. And please don't design that future self in your mind because it's more beautiful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the only real obstacles in this world are the ones we persistently believe. Yeah, that's and the, the realest part of this illusion of Maya is what we feel. Thank you so much, Zach. Such a pleasure to have you here. And um, we'll see you guys next time.